My name is Carrie Ginger, and I'm your host of Know Better, Live Best. Our guest today is a physical therapist. Matt Foster has spent most of his career treating various orthopedic and neurological conditions. Listen in as Matt discusses the difference between chronic and acute injuries and the role he sees nutrition having in physical therapy and your overall health. Know Better Live Best is dedicated to supporting food and health literacy in people of all ages. Our mission is to cut through the misinformation surrounding food, health, and nutrition because we believe that when people know better, they can make the right choices and live their best lives. We are presented by Biteable Foods. They use blockchain and Internet of Things technology to build traceable, transparent food systems because it shouldn't take an investigative journalist to find out where food comes from. Well, hello. I am here with Matt Foster, physical therapist. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining me today. Hi. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited for this. Like I said, I've had plenty of um, physical therapy in my background, so it's always fun to talk to another one. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, So I work for, I'm in St. Louis. I'm located in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I work for BJC or Barnes Jewish Christian West County Hospital. Um, in sports therapy and rehab, uh, located in Chesterfield, Missouri, which is just outside of St. Louis. A um, little bit about me. Um, I graduated physical therapy school in 2015. I graduated with another contributor, from what I gather, Alex. Um, her and I were in the same PT school class. So, um, but we... Uh, and then since then, I've been working outpatient orthopedics. I worked in Illinois for a while. Um, I also, and before I came back down to St. Louis, uh, I worked primarily, I would say, with orthopedic, chronic pain. Um, I've done dabbled in aquatics, uh, strength and conditioning. So a little bit of everything, I think, at least when it comes to the outpatient orthopedic realm of therapy. So. Oh, you're so helpful to so many people. I'm just (laughs) speaking from experience like, yes, people out there can do that. So how did you end up in physical therapy? How did that, how did, what what was your life story that led you there? You know, I think that if you would have told me when I was in high school that I would have became a physical therapist, I would have said you were crazy. (laughs) Uh, it, It was, it's one of those things where I actually, so when I was in high school, I had the, what's called the terrible triad knee injury where you tear your ACL, your MCL, and then your medial meniscus. Uh, that was, I, I, and that's why I joke if you, it, it was a very painful rehab. That one was a tough rehab. Um, so I think if you would have told me that I would have became a PT back then, I would have thought you're crazy because I did not enjoy going to therapy at that point in time. Um, definitely well worth it because it got me back to doing what I wanted to do. But I would say the ultimate turning point was probably when I went to college, I was originally pre-med and I went through about two and a half years of pre-med and like getting ready, you know, trying to get ready to apply for medical school. Um, at that point in time, I suffered an ankle and foot injury where I broke my fibula and dislocated my tibia and it was kind of a traumatic injury. And so I had to be put back together in that area with like with a steel plate and screws and things like that and at that point in time um you know i I was non-weight bearing and then after i got cleared to put weight bearing i had a surgeon who was just like okay start walking on it and that was really challenging for me i i tried and i but i had this little twig of a leg basically that wasn't really capable so it became my, my personal project because I wasn't going to school at this point in time since the, the injury was pretty traumatic and I was away at school and I had to go home back home and live with my parents for a little while. Um, but so then it became my own personal project because I didn't feel like I was ready to just start walking right away. And so I went online and scoured, you know, and trying to find all kinds of sources for rehabbing my foot and ankle and at that point in time it became one of those things where it was like my own personal project and it was something that I really grew enjoy and that's how I got into it. and at that point I decided to switch uh, from pre-med and went pre-PT instead so that's how I got into it. Well that's when something really becomes a passion because it was so important to you it hit home you took the time to go out and research because you wanted to help your body and then you're like hey there's other people out there they're going to need this and you can go and you know change the world like that because chronic pain or 
um, coming back from surgeries, it's a big deal. I and mean, you also have to be mentally tough to get through it. It's not just the rehab. So you did both those. So I bet your patients can really relate to you because oh, yeah. you've been through it. You understand how it goes. It's, it's definitely the empathy factor is, mm -hmm. is very helpful whenever you're, re when you're rehabilitating people. Um, honestly, I think that could be the most powerful thing I can provide in some ways to, is just letting patients know that I've been in their shoes multiple times. So. Right. Yeah, not just once. Like, I've had a few things going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, I have a newfound um, understanding for, like, even the elderly or anyone who's been in chronic pain when they might be a little grumpy. I'm like, mm-hmm. I totally understand what they're going through now. Like that really wears on you. So For like, sure. yeah. And you just seem like you're someone that can really listen to your patients just yeah. after talking to you for a little while, you can see that you listen so well. And that's, that goes a long way, especially coming from someone who's had, you know, I've asked why well, the ACL, not the other two, but mm -hmm. different things like that. And you need someone that, you know, cares and understands like, this is tough. <laughs> oh, I totally yeah. Agree. yeah. So I know my perception of PT, but what do you think the general public's perception is? Um, you know, I, I honestly think that the general public's perception, that's probably one of the biggest hurdles that we're trying to deal with from, uh, mm -hmm. from physical therapy's perspective. Um, I know the APTA is working very hard when it comes to really getting out there what exactly we do. I, it's, it's changed, I would say, over the, the recent history, maybe the last 10 years, because we're getting more referrals. We're getting referred to by nurse practitioners, doctors, uh, phys physicians, assistants. They're becoming more knowledgeable of what we do. Um, I also think it's a generational thing where uh, the younger generations like Gen X, millennials, and now Gen Z, they're, they're going to more often the physical therapy. So they kind of understand what we are about. But overall, I would say that the majority of people still view physical therapy as just you have a surgery or you have a traumatic accident and then you go to therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily all the other aspects that we can, that we can bring to the table. We do a lot more than just people that have sustained an injury. Um, now we're becoming more preventative medicine, which is very beneficial. And that's actually where I work. That was one of the reasons why I decided to come work for where I'm at because BJC West County is all about preventative medication. And so are, pre are just preventative services in general, and I think that's a great thing, and that's really, honestly, I would say that's the majority of what we're doing in therapy now is we're trying to be preventative with things. Oh, that is huge. I feel like the public in general can, I was just talking to someone yesterday, you know, I'm just used to this pain now. I'm like, no, stop, don't get used to your pain. Like, there's a life outside of pain. I can, I can speak to that. It's like we come, and Alex, who you were oh, yeah. with, she's a big advocate for that as well. Like, you know, normal you know, what you feel is normal is not something you should accept. Like, go find out and help yourself. So I love the preventative part. That is huge for people. It's like, realize there's life outside of pain. Go see a PT yes. <laughs> or whoever you need to do it and check it out. So you touched on how, like, some of your service, like, preventative, how that's changed. Is there anything else with PT over time, like, services? Um, you know, I, it, so we started out like as a profession, I, I believe if I know the history correctly, where we started out very big and like PTs became around during like the polio area, like polio era, whenever polio was very big. Um, and then over the course of like the, the profession slowly developed, whereas like the 80s or 90s, we were kind of, I guess, more subservient to orthopedic surgeons in particular, orthopedic physicians where we, we had a lot of referrals for massage and, and different other types of modalities, ultrasound, heat, stem, things like that, um, just because there wasn't a ton of research yet at that point in time. Um, now, I, I feel like more so therapy really started to hit its stride probably starting in the 2000s. I think that other people may say it started earlier, but at least from my viewpoint, it was probably 2000s. Um, and then, and now we have such little different branches. So I work primarily orthopedics, which is what I can speak to best to, but mm -hmm. I do get a few neurological patients as well. Um, therapy is now branched into work, car cardiovascular, oncology, geriatrics. Um, I did aquatics for a little while as a therapist. And I think that one of the biggest growing one now is women's health um, in particular. Like, and I shouldn't, I almost kind of, um, pause when I say women's health because it's more like pelvic health. There is mm -hmm. plenty of males out there that require that you know that need it as well. Um, 
but I would say, you know, nowadays therapists, we are one of the frontline options for the opioid epidemic as well, because that really peaked um, from just people being prescribed a lot of opioids. And now we're trying to get away from that as a society and not be so drug dependent on opioids. Mm -hmm. So physical therapists, we're one of the very frontline people that is, that's getting those referrals for, you know, people that are cutting down on, or physicians that are cutting down on patients that are opioid, you know, opioid epidemic type stuff. Um, which is, which is a good thing. And then it, it, I think that our education has paralleled that because therapy has grown over time where it started as a, a bachelor's degree and then it built to a master's and now we're getting our doctorate degrees just to become more knowledgeable and prepare for the potential of maybe, I know some states do it already, but um, of direct access where you know a patient can just show up to us and we, we screen them um, obviously within our scope because, you know, we have a very specific scope, but we have been taught luckily in school uh, what our scope is and when we need to refer out to other medical professionals or anything like that. So I think just overall we're, we're becoming a much stronger ent entity for patients out there in general. Oh, I love that. Any physical therapist I've talked to, I'm just wowed by just what they know. I'm like, wow, there's people out there that know a ton. Like, I know my kindergartners really well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's so amazing what we can do. There's even times where I've been referred to physical therapy, um, whether I need it or not. And they're like, I'm like, there's physical therapy for that? Mm -hmm. Oh, didn't know that could be treated. Like, just after, I'll be real here, after my third baby, just, you know, different bladder control things for a while. You yeah, know, yeah, and, yeah. that's what you're probably talking about, part of it. And She's like, oh, we can do physical therapy for that. I'm like, there's physical therapy for that. Yep. And it's like the things you learn. I'm like, oh, how interesting is that? Yes. I love well, it. I think that it, I probably have that conversation once a day with patients on okay. when they come in. Like if I have a brand new patient, I would say actually probably more so like what, a couple times a week with new evaluations. They're like, I didn't know I could get therapy for this. <laughs> um, you know, it, and so it's, it's, it's very, it's actually fun. I think it's very fun to educate people. And that's probably, as a therapist, I mean, we have the benefit of spending a lot of time with patients, whereas mm -hmm. other professions out there don't necessarily have the amount of time that we do. Yeah. You know, we get 45 minutes to an hour just to evaluate and then half hour to 45 minutes to sometimes up to, to an hour to spend with our patients whenever we are treating them. And so we get a lot of quality time for education. A lot of times our patients are asking us the questions that they've been dying to, mm -hmm. you know, that they've been dying to ask the doctor. But unfortunately doctors these days, they're, they're, you know, they're booked, they're very packed. booked up and they have, they have very packed schedules. And so they only have a limited amount of time. So then it, it the onus falls on us. And so we, it, we pick that up and we try and work with the education because luckily we have the resources and we can read, you know, the doctor's reports and everything like that. So it's, uh, education's our, our biggest weapon as a therapist for sure. So you were talking about evaluating your patients. What type of approach do you usually take when someone comes in or someone's referred to you? Obviously you have notes that you've read from the doctor and I'm sure things that come in, but. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think honestly, the biggest, the biggest thing that I can do as the therapist is I look at the, the patient, I obviously, before I see a patient, I'm looking at the doctor's note, look, notes. I'm looking to see if they've had any type of imaging, um, any type of results from that. But that doesn't always dictate exactly where we're going to go with it, and especially if it's just a patient that's had some type of chronic pain in the past. Um, you know, if somebody's post-surgical, that's a little bit different of a story because those are those times where we follow a protocol in the early mm -hmm. stages until we progress them to a point where, you know, they're independent with that protocol and now we can start building them up at that point. But um, for a lot of our patients are just, you know, knee pain, neck pain, back pain. And so then it's on us to kind of try and find strategies. So I, I think the biggest thing is listening to the patient. Like you had mentioned earlier, listening is very key. Um, and we are very lucky in the fact that we have the opportunity to listen to our patients and to take the time to listen to them when it comes to their specific complaints or asking them what particular motions, what particular movements cause pain, um, are there certain activities that they wanna build to get back to? Because a lot of times knowing the patient's goals, you have to find what makes that patient tick. Mm -hmm. And everybody is different. Um, you know, whereas one person might be like, well, I just wanna you know, walk to the mailbox without my back hurting. You know, as something as simple as that, you know, that may be their goal, whereas, 
then we get, you know, we might get college athletes or, you know, it, that just need to go back to playing their sport. So every person's goal is different and we have to adjust like our treatment when it comes to that patient's goal. But I think that's probably the biggest thing that I do when it comes to um, how I look at a patient is I start off by listening and learning the patient's goals. Mm -hmm. um, once I get past that, then it's the actual evaluation perspective where, you know, we're looking at postures, we're listening to pain, we're looking at locations of pain, um, we're looking at in particular imbalances, whether that be flexibility or whether it be strength of um, certain things, finding out what's dominant in a patient, where they might be too active in, and um, something that's not quite firing as well. I don't like to use the word weakness with my patients because more often than not, patients know how to, you know, patients can move it or they can, you know, recruit it, but they're just maybe not used to doing it. So it's getting something working that the body is just kind of let go on vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just looking at different activity modifications, uh, you know, if I have patients that have pain when it comes to work, you know, their work, like learning, looking at how maybe their work setup is, their desk setup. Um, or if they have pain with running or things like that, looking at their mechanics when it comes to that. Um, and, and those are, those are definitely big things. And I, I think that one of the, the big growing things too, is even just as simple as it sounds, looking at people's breathing mechanics has changed mm -hmm. quite a bit. You had mentioned with, you know, after you had your third child, uh, right. after your third child, you went to therapy and a lot of pelvic things is definitely turning into breathing mechanics and core stabilization. Um, is quite a huge thing in therapy as well. So we're, there's, there's a lot of all-encompassing things. I'm sure that if you ask this question to multiple therapists out there, you'd get a ton of different answers because we all try and look at you know, similar things, but then we all have our little things that we, we do. But overall, I would say our biggest thing is looking at patient goals, listening to the patient and activity modifications are huge. It's like really helping that quality of life. Like what is going to make your life better? Because like so those goals can be different. Walking to the mailbox, which seems like so simple, but that is a big deal for some. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Yes, being able to walk somewhere without pain is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious, so different areas of pain. Do you ever find, and I'm sure you do, but are patients ever surprised by maybe something that's wrong with their body they didn't know was wrong? Like they thought like, oh, my hips, you know, are hurting, but maybe, or my knee, but it, stem from the hip or something. I don't know if that's even a thing, but I'm just curious. <laughs> sure. um, you know, I think luckily, I, luckily medic, medicine's not becoming quite so tunnel vision. So oftentimes the, if we're getting a referral from the physician, the physicians are already done a pretty good job mm -hmm. of looking into that and they might be able to further kind of, you know, help narrow us in to what they think it is. And then obviously we do our own evaluation to double check that. Um, but more often than not, I, I almost think that it, it, your question's interesting because I almost think that sometimes patients, uh, they have such, with the internet nowadays and WebMD and everything, I think patients come in with more knowledge than they ever have. Um, and, and oftentimes it's us trying to cut through the things that maybe they've read or maybe their friends told them or maybe their friend's husband, you know, or friend's wife or husband that's a medical professional is, you know, guess that or anything like that. It's, it's really narrowing it down is, is definitely becoming the challenging part. So I, I would say that more often than not, yes, I, I can tell patients different things about themselves, more related to, I would say, posture and how they're moving because that's really tends to be our wheelhouse when it comes to looking at postural imbalances, looking at their breathing mechanics, looking um, how they move, you know, can they brace, things like that. So education from that standpoint, for sure, I can do that. But um, oftentimes, like I said, I think I'm more so almost narrowing things down a little bit to, because they've delved into so many sources of information already that they might even have conflicting things. So it's that's more, I would say, the challenge than than finding something on them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the internet's great, but you can find the worst illness with any pain you have. So it's oh like you got to be careful. <laughs> yes. I know I can. So I actually don't, I do not search much on the internet when it comes to that because I know what my mind will do. So I'm like, well, if it's a problem, I'm just going to go be seen and I'm going to let them decide. 
yeah. <laughs> what's around with me because I know I'm not the person that should be go searching on my own because I'll find yeah. something I don't want to find even if it's not the case so you have an extremely rewarding job I can only imagine Mm -hmm. So, do you have any big or favorite success stories? You know, I that's a fun that's a that's a tough question um, because I, I think that you can find reward in really in a lot of aspects of what we do um, and in multiple patients. It was it's hard to narrow down to specific patients. I have a couple. I, I think one of my favorite populations in particular that I get to work with are probably the younger, like the adolescent population because they don't really have a stake in it other than they want to get back to running around and playing their sport. So they're very rewarding to treat just in general. Um, I, I, I think that I, I have a couple in mind for sure. Um, two young girls I was actually rehabbing at a similar point in time and one was trying to get back to volleyball, one was trying to get back to track, and they were just such motivated kids. And them being so motivated and helping them overcome what fears they maybe have had from an injury, um, that was a lot of fun. So those two are very memorable for me in general. Uh, I've also had plenty of uh, medical doctors as patients too. And I actually, so some sometimes people are, are intimidated because they have quite a huge knowledge base. Um, but I, I enjoy, I have fun with that. Um, just because we can give a whole different perspective and being able to show them what we can do is really beneficial. Um, I had a, I had a, an MD before who had had a spine injury and just being able to show them, you know, everything that they'd maybe learned in a textbook, um, you know, that we could, and I just, we altered some of his mechanics. We gave him a couple corrective exercises and we save him from surgery. Um, and they thought surgery was coming down the pipe. And so being able to offer that is is quite fun when it comes to, and show, and really kind of just show off what we're capable of doing in the therapy realm. Um, plus, really, when you get the patients that have come in, and they've, like we talked about, patients are more educated than they've ever been because they can go online and they can read about things. And oftentimes, like you said, the, the internet is gloom and doom. Um, and with some things, it, it's okay. very... It can be very gloom and doom. So being able to take those beliefs and change them by giving them strategies or giving them activities or giving them exercises to turn themselves around. And obviously, we're a gradual process in therapy. Mm -hmm. We are Every once in a while, don't get me wrong, every once in a while, we hit a home run and we can get people turned around in a couple sessions. But more often than not, we're a process. Um, and I'm, I'm totally okay with that, but I think that just being able to show people that the process is worth it versus maybe some other invasive procedures is, mm -hmm. is very, uh, that's very rewarding. Oh, absolutely. And quick fixes, we find out a lot of the times don't come out to be what we hope they are. It's like usually it takes a process to mm -hmm. truly heal, and that could be when it comes you know, to food or physical therapy yeah. or just changing your mindset. It's all a process, and I think if you take that time to really put into it, you are going to change, and then it's probably it's going to stick longer. I, uh, I um, totally agree because there's there we we try our biggest thing is we try and empower people, mm -hmm. um, being able to give people the tools so that they don't have to rely on us forever. Uh, you know mm -hmm. that they can treat themselves, give them, the, so give them the education so that way they can get back to doing the things that they want to do so that way they're not always relying on a medical professional to, you know, constantly give them maybe passive things, you know, it, to treat their pain issue or whatever they're coming to therapy for. So empowerment's huge in, in, in the physical therapy profession. And that goes a long way, too, because I think sometimes the mindset can be like, oh, just I'm going to go back and they just keep wanting my money. But like what you just said. I want them to not come back to me. If I've done my job well, I'm not going to see them again in a positive way because they're out living their life and I did what I needed to do for them. So that's amazing to me when you just hear that because I've always had great experiences with doctors and physical therapists and things like that. So I have no negative feelings. It's always been really positive for me. But just hearing that's like they're not out just to make a buck or not most. They're, I mean, it's a business. That's how they make their money. Totally. <laughs> However, you care about what you do and you don't want them coming back to you. You don't want to see them walking in again like, oh, it's not working yep. out so well. I, I, it, whenever I discharge patients after we're finished and 
um, and that you know whether they have the tools or whether their problems resolved. You know, oftentimes I'm discharging them. I'm like, well, I hope I never have to see you again. And I don't mean that in a negative way when I say that. It's just you know I I'm giving them the tools so that way hopefully this doesn't be a recurring thing for them and they don't have to come back at that point. Oh, absolutely. So when you because you mentioned a little earlier about whether you need to refer a patient out if maybe you've done what you had to do. So how do you know when you for sure come to that point? I think that'd be kind of tricky, but I mean, I also don't have your knowledge. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very, it's, that can be a challenging thing. Um, you know, I think I've been asked before, where does, you know, where does therapy fall short? I could honestly mm -hmm. say that we don't, we can always make a dent into something. There are not too many things that we can at least make a dent into. Um, there will be times where, that, that does occur where, you know, typically if I've been treating somebody and they've been pretty darn diligent with their stuff for, you know, up to a month to two months, then, then at that point I'm starting to kind of, you know, think, okay, is there something more that something that I can't do that I need to refer out to that patient out to, um, whether that be something, I mean, we, we don't, and so we obviously, we, we can refer back to doctors, but mm -hmm. there are plenty of other professionals out there that we can, you know, potentially send patients to as well. Um, where I work at, we, we also have massage therapy on, and so they do myofascial therapy. Um, some patients end up having, they have good luck with chiropractic as well. Um, I'm not a therapist that is anti-chiropractic. I know that sometimes people are like, you know, cats and dogs mm -hmm. with that, but really there are very great chiropractors out there and they can provide, as, and it's one of those things, as long as people can get help somewhere, doesn't matter to me where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I would say there will always be a place, especially in, you know, other parts of medicine, whenever we get, whenever we run into that roadblock of just, you know, there at a certain point, usually we know about a month or two and we kind of know if something's not going to work and if we need to send somebody off to somebody else, whether that be, you know, a different professional. Another one that I forgot to mention is, as weird as it sounds, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, whether that be counseling, especially with chronic oh. pain patients, has been gaining steam. Um, and that and that area, just being able to teach people coping skills, mm -hmm. so that is turning into a new thing that sometimes therapists are, you know, pushing, you know, or not not pushing, but you know, just maybe, you know, planting the seed in patients' head. That's really interesting because I was, so my situation when it came to when I finally did surgery, and I had a great surgeon, he was someone that was not quick to do it. We, he, we tried everything we do, but I was pregnant. And when I actually came to the point where I literally could not move, there's nothing you could do. I was pregnant. You just like had to wait it out. It was right. just, you know, we, we tried a lot of different things. And my chiro, I used a chiropractor. He would come to my house, like so awesome, like trying to help me out. And eventually after I had the baby, I thought it'd be better and it was worse. And then, you know, it's you know, long story short, mm -hmm. I ended down that road. But I just, I, I started looking into the mind a bit. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to try to grasp at anything, but I found it really interesting. Now, no, it didn't take my pain away. It was legit there and, you know, but it, it helped me, I think, in other ways. So I'm really, I think that's really neat that you brought that up because I think it's something people, you know, should take seriously, that yep. our body really works together. And I think we're just now, maybe not me, I think professionals are really starting to scratch that surface of that like the mind body connection almost in a way it doesn't take away what you need for physical therapy and possible surgeries but it's a very interesting you know another conversation sometime <laughs> no it's 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 gaining steam in, in the pt world we're kind of looking at it as like a neuro pain science is what we we look at it from from coping like learning coping strategies um you had made you had made mention you know that the mind is very powerful and our brain uh, and the, it, ultimately, our nerves can pick up a sense, but our brain is what determines what is that signal that's going to the nerve um, or coming from the nerve. So it's it's one of those things that our brain is ultimately what determines what's a pain signal. Um, mm -hmm. And oftentimes, if an area is painful, our brain will just constantly watch that area. I always I always give people the analogy. It would be like if a, if a burglar broke into your house, 
uh, kind of a reactive thing that we do is we set up an alarm system in the house at that point. And our brain is very good at that when we've had an injury. Uh, you know, our, we never notice our pinky toe until we stub our pinky toe. Yes. And, it, and then we focus on it for like 48 hours, you know, really hard because it's hard to walk and it hurts. Um, but then, you know, and hopefully the goal is eventually that goes away. But sometimes our, it, uh, sometimes when pain last there longer our brain adapts to that stressor and so it can, becomes much more conscious of that area of the body mm -hmm. oh i think everyone can relate to that when you're like how come i'm just i seem to be hurting you know your knee or whatever it is like over the last few weeks how come it's always there it's because your mind's focusing on it for sure or you notice commercials for a certain medicine maybe treating your injury all of a sudden where it was always on the tv you're just now focusing in on it it's not that it's showing up trying to tell you something it's just funny your brain's focusing on it like you said yep I, the pain's there it's just you know, mm -hmm. what's going to happen so have you ever given advice um where you might touch on a more like holistic way to help some of your patients yeah uh i i honestly i kind of view therapy as holistic therapy in some ways just because you know we're we're looking at, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of different variables whenever we treat our patients. You know, I think a lot of times if people that are just very, that are even familiar with PTA, they look, okay, where well, you're going to test my flexibility, you're going to look at my strength, you're going to, you know, and, and then you'll give me stuff and then I'll be on my way. Well, we're, we're, you know, we're looking at how you're moving, how you're bracing, how you're breathing. Um, therapy is, is really expanding and it's looking at, you know, different other types of things like dry needling. I know therapists yeah. out there do forms of dry needling. Um, and then some, and then there's instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, which is like a form of gua sha, which, um, or at least, you know, it's, it's really, it's in that same family. Um, and then, you know, looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, looking at coping mechanisms, and then we are, our education has been expanded to the point where we learn a little bit of each exercise realm as well in school. And then it's on us if we want to continue to expand in those. But um, I, I've worked with therapists that have also been yoga practitioners as well. And so I, I think I view, I guess I tend to view therapy just in the grand scheme as holistic, um, just from those services that we could provide it. But then it's not even including education when it comes to sleeping habits um, mm -hmm. sleeping habits are very big when it comes to recovery from an injury um, certain dietary modifications are also very big um, you know oftentimes that uh, when a patient when they come to us and they they're referred to us by a doctor that luckily their doctor takes care of the majority of the advice that they can be given from that or if it's you know if it's something where they need to lose weight but we can always echo things or provide different venues to get them started on that as well. Um, so we, we dabble, you know, in, in multiple different areas. Sometimes we're almost like, uh, I always joke that we're kind of like life coaches as well. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I, I tend to view just our entire profession as a holistic type profession in general. That's got, actually, that's really interesting because I, PT, I feel has been around just, you know, obviously most of my life and you just see it as something you do if you need it but when you just put it that way that that totally is holistic when you think about like the definition of that it absolutely is and like the life coach I think it's funny you, <laughs> you're you remind me of our you know common friend Alex and whenever I talk to her I'm like oh my gosh I just feel better after talking to her she's just so knowledgeable <laughs> in a way like a life coach yeah <laughs> I so I agree with you. you guys are life coaches I feel like everyone needs a good physical therapist in their life <laughs> we appreciate that too so. so you kind of talked about nutrition a bit or you know whether it's losing weight so how much do you touch on that with patients does that always come up does it depend on the patient and their physical health or is it always just touched on no matter what I think in I would say in some aspects, it's usually always touched on a little bit. More often than not, if, patient, if a patient comes and they, you know, and they know that maybe they're overweight, they're, they're very, most of them are very upfront about it. Um, and so then it opens the door to allow us to talk to us about, or, you know, to at least because oftentimes if we're getting patients, a, a lot of times we're getting patients that have not been active in a very long time. And it is our job to not only help them with why they're coming to therapy, but then to give them resources so that way they can continue to get active. 
from that point standpoint on any type of weight loss thing. Um, as far as nutritional things, I, I think that something that's definitely not, you know, not talked about enough is just the overall, like making sure that you're eating what is the correct, you know, not necessarily the correct things, but eating actually things with nutritional value. Um, in the therapy realm, we are, you know, oftentimes we are strengthening patients and without proper protein intake, it is very hard to actually build lean muscle mass. Um, and if people are wanting, if their goal is fat loss, well, without fat, without carbohydrates, you can't actually burn your fat. And so that's, that's one of those. So I'm, I'm sure that I shouldn't say that as like a, you know, um, a sweeping comment there. There's, there's other ways. But in general, you do need carbohydrate intake to be able to turn the wheel in order to burn fat as well. Um, so I, I do have those conversations with patients, especially with my patients that have maybe had some type of surgery. Um, and they are, you know, non weight bearing for a little while to help prevent atrophy. It's like, okay, make sure um, you are in that you're eating enough protein that you are actually trying to maintain what lean muscle mass that you do have. Um, making, you know, making sure that your body has fuel whenever you're coming to therapy, um, making sure that you're hydrating as well. Our joints love hydration. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, with, with there's so many different drink options out there, you know, whether it be soda, whether it be uh, energy drinks, whether it be alcohol, you know, there's a lot of things that are diuretics that, you know, that zap hydration out of our joints. Mm -hmm. And so hydration is very key as well. So I do have those conversations with patients. And it's so important because it's never just a one fix. You know, there's not one thing that's going to fix. You have to look at the whole person like you say you do. The hydration is just big. I noticed that with me. I can wake up in the morning and just feel like I didn't get any sleep. And I think about the day before and I'm like, oh, that was a really busy day. I'm like, did I get my water in the way I usually do? And that makes a big deal. And um, with me, and I know other people have done this too, I really look at the foods that are inflammatory because you know, I have osteoarthritis and I'm not going down that route. I'm going to heal these or at least make them better. And, you know, with my back, just different things going on. So I've really tried to focus on foods that are giving me the nutritional values and, you know, the protein I need, depending on what foods I want that from, but just what's not going to inflame me. And I notice a difference, you know, because I have the body of like a seven year old, you know, at the age of six, that's fine. But at least I'm trying to work on it. And there's, yeah, nutrition can help and along with physical therapists or doctors or chiropractors and, and things like that. So, and you did, you did talk about this a little bit, but barriers in nutrition, like I'm kind of wondering, is it like, there's just so many fad diets out there? Do you think people really just don't know what actual good nutrition is? Um, I think that it's probably more the last, I mean, there's, there's definitely fat, there's plenty of fad diets out there. I think, you know, that's not news to anybody. No, um, and that will continue to be. <laughs> yeah, but there will always, because always people are striving to be like, this is the diet that's going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. um, when really just having a balance, you know, life's about balance in general. Mm -hmm. You know, you're never going to be perfect, especially in the world that we live in. It's very difficult to be perfect when it comes to having, when people have busy lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, but just, I, I think majority of people have, you know, even if maybe they don't want to admit it, they have a good idea of what's a good choice. Right. And so oftentimes it's defaulting to that common sense choice. Um, but then, then you get into the fact that that's, uh, or the, the realm of nutri you know, nutritionists, uh, there has been nutrition. I have worked with nutritionists in the past, um, where if I had a, a patient that was interested in really honing in on what they needed from a nutrition standpoint for what their, whether that be from a sport perspective or whether that be from a medical condition perspective, um, that we can, you know, oftentimes suggest nutrition, like nutritionists, the the certified nutritionists out there are very intelligent people. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I think they're kind of a realm in the medical world that isn't, you know, that there's just not enough knowledge about, and they can provide that knowledge to patients. So, um, as you know, as far as what is what I can do, yeah, I think from from a barriers perspective, there's definitely some barriers in nutrition when it comes. But oftentimes, I. I'm educating probably on just the, the small bare minimum of that. And if somebody wants more advanced things, I realize that may not be necessarily my scope and it might be something where I refer somebody to someone else. 
Well, that's important though. You're, you're, you're listening, like I said, we said this a lot, you're listening to your patients and then you're kind of taking their lead. You're picking up without pushing them maybe too much because obviously what you're there for is the physical therapy. But if you're seeing how they're really interested in the nutrition and they want to see if that can aid in their recovery, that you refer them out. And I think hopefully nutritionists and people in that field, hopefully that's gaining steam. Yes. Where we can have, you know, another set of, um, expertise to to help us so do you find that more in patients that maybe have chronic injuries or chronic pain or is that just people who just happen to be curious um i it it depends so i think it's split i I, we still get our our fair share of of post-surgical patients or people that have had traumatic injury but honestly i think that we're getting more and more chronic pain patients for sure. I think that therapy, especially with uh, what we're trying to do with the opioid epidemic, um, which brings me to another point that I should have talked about in the last little blip that you asked me. So we can, luckily, I think the biggest thing as therapists is we do have the education when it comes to supplementation too. Mm -hmm. Um, With, if we have somebody, you know, with chronic pain or you had mentioned like inflammation earlier, um, being able to recommend different, you know, whether that be omega threes, you know, as something that's an anti and it's a natural kind of anti-inflammation type thing. And then the Midwest here in St. Louis, we do not have a lot of, I mean, we have sources of fish, but not like out on the coastal sides or anything. Right. Um, vitamin D and calcium for bone health, obviously. Um, glucosamine chondroitin is another really popular one that there's some good research behind when it comes to uh, maintaining, you know, maintaining joint health. So there I've are, heard about that one a lot, probably because of my knees. <laughs> it's probably yeah, what's popular, but, mean, and Drayton, I would say, yeah, fish oils, omega-3s, and vitamin D and calcium are definitely the ones that we can provide some education on as well. But um, anyways, back to you were talking about the, the chronic injury. I would say that, yes, that's, that's definitely growing. Um, we look at chronic injury because a chronic injury is more so we look at as if something's been lasting for you know, six to eight, we- six to eight weeks. Um, okay. Sometimes even an acute injury can take two to four injury or two to four weeks to heal. Um, and then, whereas if it's more of like a chronic one where they've, they've been injured and technically, you know, the, the inflammatory phase is done at that point in time, but yet they're still having pain. Um, that's what we deem more of a, a chronic injury or maybe even something that, you know, somebody injured, two years ago and like for instance you're back and then you had a flare up and then you know it goes away for a little while and then it comes back one of those recurring type things as Mm -hmm. well Um, and then I think congenital things do fall in this realm whether people with like a a rheumatoid arthritis where they just have a little bit more of a joint breakdown or people that come in with scoliosis um, things like that you know where it's a little more congenital Um, those are, we're seeing, you know, definitely seeing more of those from the chronic injury perspective. But I think from the chronic injury perspective, the biggest thing that we battle as therapists is for sure battling the personal fears of that Mm -hmm. patient. Because once an injury occurs and then it keeps happening over and over and over, it definitely gets up here and it becomes a a fear of that patient's. And so, or I I keep referring to patients, but just people in general. Yeah. Um, and so just being able to, to help and assist with that personal fear is sometimes um, just, as, just as big. <laughs> oh, it's huge. I actually, I have I seem to talk about myself a lot today, but I, so I'm a little over a, a year out from my surgery and it was a long process even before that of just constant pain. I'm talking like years. <laughs> and I was holding my daughter, 15 months old, and I fell down the stairs. I slipped and fell down the stairs with her like last week. And... Like, I mean, it hurt, obviously, but, and I've had plenty of pain. I don't cry from pain, not usually. Like, I've had enough to where I'm like, this is, you know, it is what it is. And I had tears in my eyes, and I started thinking about it as I'm sitting on the steps, I think, still in shock and making sure my daughter's okay. It was that fear of going back to where I was that it instantly overwhelmed me, and I didn't realize it was still there. Um, like, in my mind, I'm like, I, I can't go back there. I cannot go back to where I was. Like, I can't do it. And that's what I noticed. It was almost just overwhelming just feeling and I started I'm like no I'm okay like I'm all right (laughs) I always describe it to patients as uh, I I think it's the Pavlov's dog experiment (laughs) where you ring the bell and then the dog you know and then the dog gets a treat and it starts salivating but after a point it just responds to the ringing of the bell even if there's you know no treat that's coming and so um, 
that is very common. It is extremely common in giving people the giving people the confidence that they're able to handle that they're more resilient, that their body's more resilient than what they yeah. think it is, um, is definitely something that's empowering that we can do. Well, it's, it, um, it's interesting how people go see a physical therapist, they go see a doctor, they go see someone that's in the medical field that has amazing knowledge and they tell you, you know, you're going to be okay. This is, you know, this is fine. Do this, but no, what you're experiencing um, will get better. And it's amazing how quickly you feel better just mm -hmm. because someone told you you're okay. Yep. You know, it, it takes, I think it takes that worry out of your mind. Kind of what you're just talking about. Mm -hmm. So with, we, we've been talking a lot about chronic injuries now or, or chronic pain, not just injuries. Do you, and you, t you did touch on this a bit, but is there anything else of what you might do differently for those people that are dealing with it? Because also it's that, it's that mind too, where they're constantly in pain. What kind of approach do you take that you haven't maybe mentioned already? Um, so I think, I, I think to really just, by even just backing up, so acute injury, um, you know, if somebody has a traumatic injury or something like that, you know, obviously there's this big inflammatory phase within a joint, you know, swelling um, can occur. That's blood and white blood cells trying to help with that body's natural response to try and um, to repair that area. And then there's the old, the old rice principles that I think that most people are familiar with, the rest, ice, compression, elevation. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are okay for the acute injuries, obviously, because the, sometimes there is no, there is no um, substitute for just having a little bit of rest so that you can actually let those tissues heal. But when it comes to, the actual chronic pain aspect of things, that's when things change because oftentimes that tissue is already, that, that tissue is healed technically. If you threw somebody in some type of imaging, then it, you would look at that, they would be able to look at that and see, well, nothing's, nothing's wrong here. And so sometimes, and, but yet that patient still has that pain or that person still has that pain. Um, so our approach has to change. Um, because if they continue to do the same things, if they're sitting there thinking, okay, I just need to rest this and continue to ice this and do those things, and it still doesn't change, then we need to change our strategy. Um, I think it's Einstein that said about the definition of in insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so then that's when we will get a patient and we are looking at those imbalances. We're looking at their flexibility, their look. They're changed, uh, and the, you know we're looking at modifications that we can do. Um, we're even talking about we, we talk about. I've talked about breathing a couple times when it comes to relaxing the nervous system because the nervous system, oftentimes with a patient that's experienced a lot of pain, it's revved up. It's very high all the time because their body's in that fight or flight response from really feeling that pain. So getting patients to lower down just to calm themselves down. Um, and teaching them, you know, deep breathing techniques or diaphragmatic breathing techniques um, is very big with that. And then really, I, I would say just from the orthopedic standpoint, um, I'll speak to that because we are loading the tissues differently. And when I say loading, meaning I, we're exercising. So, you know, we can, we can stretch it. If they have something that's chronically shortened um, and needs stretched, you know, we might start with that, but overall the goal is to load that area and to make it stronger so that way it is more resilient against a potential injury in the future, especially if it's a chronic injury. Um, and our body responds really well when it comes to a chronic injury, um, when it comes to different types of loading. So uh, there's, there's different muscular phases where the muscle, whenever you contract it and it's shortening, that's the concentric phase. When it's lengthening, that's the eccentric phase. And whenever it's contracting, like, and it's staying the same length, like if you're doing like a wall sit, everyone's favorite exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so those, we, we tend to stay in that isometric. We start off with like isometric and eccentric where the muscle's lengthening because our tissues respond very well to those when it, when it comes to chronic injury in general. And those tend to be more of the strength building phases, especially eccentric where it's lengthening um, because we're trying to, you know, that tissue maybe is already healed, but we need to remodel that tissue. Mm -hmm. So whenever people are contracting the muscle and it's lengthening, it causes those tiny little micro tears. And sometimes I hate saying that because it freaks people out. I'm like, no, it's okay. That's that little bit of muscle soreness that, you are, that you're getting. And it allows your muscles or your tendons, honestly, because the muscle goes into the tendon, which goes into the bone. 
um, and it allows the those properties to you know to help be remodeled again. It, it brings blood flow to that area to bring a new healing response to that area. So that's I would say that's the biggest w difference in what we're doing for a chronic injury versus an acute injury. Yeah, that was that was news to me actually. Even just a few months ago, I went and I'm like, I'm still having this, you know, what I thought was nerve pain, and they're like, Yeah, you pray, you very well could be. Those my nerves were shot. They're like, but it was everything you just talked about. We need to like, you know, lengthen them or I think what you just said is still very new to be. But that can be the pain I was feeling. I was like, oh, so maybe I am a lot better than I think. And again, that mind thing. But yeah, they gave me exercises to help, yeah. you know, stretch it out or, you know, things that you were talking about because I'm not in the medical field. So my verbiage is not going to be correct. But <laughs> everything that you just said. So... You then refer people, I'm thinking with the chronic pain, if they're not healed, you then just refer them maybe to, if you feel it's going to be a surgery thing, you just then refer them on if it, if you feel like what you've done is done. Yeah. And there's a, typically like, a, I oftentimes we're getting the referral from the doctor. Mm. Um, so they're sending them to us. They're giving the conservative measures, the shot first, because a lot of times I mean, we we can save it. Like we, you know, a lot of times we'll get people and we'll treat them with conservative, me, you know, medicine, and we can either fully prevent, you know, a potential more invasive procedure, or you know, we can at least delay it for sure. Um, more often than not, but yeah, if if it comes to that point where you know we we've tried, I feel like I've racked my brain. I've tried everything. Mm -hmm. I will refer back, um, and I and I used to take that really hard when I was a young therapist. Um, but now I know that there's just, that's why there's different medical professionals yeah. out there. That's why there's different, uh, professions in general out there as we all have our specialties. We all have our wheelhouse. Um, and sometimes as much as we like to think that we're superheroes, you know, there are other people that can provide very good services too. So, um, at, at a certain point, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm not afraid to do that anymore, and I don't take it personally either. <laughs> no, I understand that. That's I that can probably be many fields. Like even with teaching, if I just can't get to a child that I feel, you know, where it's academically, there's other people in the building that have different expertise that can zero in. It's like, nope, as you should actually just be proud that you're working together to help yep. whoever, you know, student, patient that you can help. So I, I totally get that feeling though, because you want to be able to help everyone that comes. Oh yeah. And with the, um, sorry, I was going to say, just to go on that too, you had mentioned with the, you, you know, you being a teacher, personality has a lot to do with this. With some, sometimes a patient may not work as well with a therapist or, you know, a different professional, and then they go to a different one and they're totally different and they work well and their personalities mesh up. Um, and so it, oftentimes it's fine, not only finding the correct, you know, professional to send somebody to but it's finding the right personality to pair somebody up with too. oh i wholeheartedly agree it's you know so that you don't care it's just finding that we have so many different personalities someone's going to mesh better than others and it's not because you're not awesome it's just because it's yep. just it's just not working so absolutely so what do you want listeners that are you know are listening right now to take away from this podcast with your information or from your field or maybe if they're skeptical of pt and they think things will just get better on their own? Um, I would say the, the, the biggest takeaway that I want patients to do, regardless of, of me as a therapist, is just, just really be their own best advocate. Um, you know, we have made mention that patients are more knowledgeable maybe than ever, and that's fine. That's okay that they're out there do researching their own, you know, things. But it's just also being open to the professional whenever you go to them. So that way you're really listening to what they have to say. Because, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes people, are, you know, we've gone through a lot of extensive training to be able to determine. So, um, but that doesn't take away. I think it's very important that patients ask questions. Be your own best advocate um, is the biggest thing that I would want people to take away from this and that um, healthy lifestyle is always going to trump mm -hmm. what we as the medical profession can do with that uh, medicine has changed so much from reactive medicine where you know something happens and then you go to now preventative medicine and that goes for other realms too whether you're going to the dentist whether you know you, you, for you, you said you've gone to a chiropractor, where you're going to a chiropractor, where you're going to your optometrist. Mm -hmm. uh, medicine is becoming more preventative to get people healthier. And so I, I think that that's the, we, as the physical therapists, we're, we fall in that same realm. 
Um, we are preventative. Our, our goal is, you know, to be able to look and do modifications or find ways to get patients back to doing what they will enjoy doing. Um, and we get the big opportunity to spend a lot of time with our patients. So I think that we can provide more often than not more than what the patient thought we were capable of doing. Um, and then I would say just from an orthopedics perspective of therapy, don't fear your injury. I think, you know, injury and pain, it's very easy to fear those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so find, you know, if you have something that scares you, you know, find, find somebody that can help find somebody that's knowledgeable, find somebody that can help alleviate those fears because the brain's a powerful thing. And yes. if we can alleviate fear, then oftentimes we can decrease pain levels right away just by alleviating fear um, and just proving to people that you are more resilient than what you maybe what you previous thought that you were. The body is amazing. Like I so said, the mind and having that open mind, but also the open mind, you advocate for yourself, but open the mind to, to listen to what the physical therapist, doctor, whoever you're seeing has to say, because you're both there for common goal to help you, you know, the patient or the person who's coming in. And when it comes to nutrition, Vital Foods presents this podcast and their big vision is transparency. And that comes in with physical therapy as well. You want to be transparent, get it all out there, know what's happening. Um, and with me, it's so important that I know, you know, where my food comes from so I can make better choices nutritionally for myself, but also an open mind and transparent for your body when you go to you. I think transparency, whether you're talking about food or, you know, your health or your body is important to know and get it out there. Don't hide anything. Yeah. You'll feel better. It's all, it's all linked together. Just kind of what you were referring to the food transparency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that you guys have likely talked about this, you know, just because something says it's organic, you know, doesn't mean that it's necessarily always better. And so food and nutrition, it, that's the fuel that we are putting in our automobile. You know, if we look at ourselves as a vessel, you know, if, we, if you want your body to function on the level of a Lamborghini, then you need to put premium fuel in that. Yes. And being able to have that transparency is helpful. Um, because our body is going to perform in all aspects um, as, you know, as best as the fuel that we give it. So I'm very, I, I, I'm very much on board with what you guys do at Bible Foods. I think it's great that you guys do that. Oh, well, thank you. Like you said, just a more transparent world that's for, for, you know, the consumer, for the people, just, you know, to make a better world and feel better and to help all those companies out there that are, you know, putting such hard work into their food, but maybe they can't have that great label, even though, you know, it's great. So like yeah. I said, healthy nutrition, check out your aches and pains, get down to it, have an open mind. And I love all of your advice. And I know all the listeners will be able to take away multiple things from this podcast because we've all had pain. We've all maybe have said it was okay and normal. So I appreciate ever everything you have even said today for our listeners. So how can people get in touch with you or find you? Uh, biggest, easiest way for sure to get in touch with me is definitely my personal email. Um, I, I'm very responsive to it. I check it very often. Um, it's, it's going to say it's, I'll, I'll make sure I write it down and give it to you too, but it's mattf3213 at yahoo.com. Um, I'm also located, I was going to say I have my profile, anybody that's here in Midwest or St. Louis area, uh, BJC West County, um, their, their website be so bjcwestcounty.org backslash star here in St. Louis and it's got my profile it's got the profiles of all of our therapists as well um, and then it has I was going to say really it's just the hospital's website in general for any patients so um, so that's but anyways that's the, the easiest way to get a hold of me awesome well St. Louis is you know lucky to have you we were lucky to have you on the podcast today and I'm excited for everyone to listen in to learn a little more about that and so thanks for joining us today Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.